Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. In today's episode, we discuss Koichi Tohei's four principles of key. Joining me for this conversation is Oliver Martinez. Before we start, please consider supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Spirit Aikido online program, which currently contains more than 170 videos. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. Welcome back uh, to Oliver Martinez, friend of mine and a fellow instructor. Uh, he's also in my lineage down from Koichi Tohei, and I really wanted to, to talk with him today about the Koichi Tohei's uh, key principles, or they're often referred to as the principles of mind-body unification. Uh, he and I both were brought up with these core principles being at the heart of our, our Aikido. Uh, and they've always been kind of a point of confusion as much as a point of clarity with both myself uh, and the, the students before me, as well as the ones under me. And as I became an instructor, I found some struggle with trying to describe these very cleanly to students and clearly, and not for any lack of description. Uh, there are plenty of descriptions out there of what these things mean. Uh, but I wanted to have Oliver on today to uh, help help clarify this a bit and maybe see if we can do perhaps even better in describing what these principles are about for the sake of uh, transferring them to students in the future. So welcome back, Oliver. It's great to talk to you again, my friend. Thank you for having me back. I've loved the last few episodes of the show, the conversations you guys are having, especially the one you and Dan had recently. I just, I loved. Um, so I, it is an absolute pleasure to, to be Excellent. back. Excellent. Well, great. Um, and you, you are my, my senpai, you came along before me. And so, and you train under Sosa from a young age, uh, Bill Sosa. And, and for those who aren't listening and listened to the, our previous conversation, uh, mine with Oliver, uh, my lineage comes down through Bill Sosa. i would never gotten to meet him. He passed away before I started Aikido. Uh, but Oliver started training under Bill Sosa, who was a student of Koichi Tohei's, uh, back in the seventies. And, uh, just to provide some context. Uh, Bill Sosa, as I understood it, split away from Koichi Tohei when Tohei started going deeper into the key development uh, aspect and less, in, he drifted more away from teaching Aikido more of, as a martial art. At least that's my understanding. So um, I wasn't there when it happened. That was a little bit, well, it was quite a bit before my time. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that was the reasoning for the split. Mm -hmm. But I do know that he had already separated um, before it had gone to a complete kind of key-based sure. um, system. It was a transition time. It wasn't like a sudden wake up one day and, and now it's just totally switched over. It's, it seemed to happen over a period of time. Yeah, I think if you look, like even at the history, probably any martial art, well, I can guarantee you any martial art, but if we look at Aikido in particular, we have these like days where like, this happened and then it was no more. And that's, you and I both know that's not how it works. These things- History yeah, doesn't work quite that way all the time. over time. So again, I wasn't there and I can't say what, um, I wouldn't speak for him anyway, uh, what his reasoning was, but I do mm -hmm. know that Aikido was presented to me as a martial system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I know when I see key Aikido now, that is not always the case. Again, I can't speak for the entire organization i'm not part of it so i, I i'm mm -hmm. not sure but uh there was definitely some sort of um uh shift in the key society that sosa sensei had already removed himself from by that point and and even though i'm a generation removed from bill sosa the training that we did had the influence of some of the key exercises and some of the focus on key but it was primarily martial it was primarily a physical thing with key being uh or the the concept of it we're going to get into this deeply of how to improve your movement how to improve your stability and how to improve your aikido from a physical standpoint by using these principles like yeah, they weren't absolutely. a total esoteric they were not totally esoteric or anything like that they were uh, focused on from practicality probably about once a month six weeks for sure since they would say something to the effect of we are spiritual beings, but we live in a physical world. So he was very clear, like the stuff's got to work here, you know, like, um, and I, I really do think so since they may have, and I'm obviously I'm biased, but he was the perfect, um, 
he walked that line between the Aikido that kind of lives in that spiritual and mental realm and the Aikido that has the function in a violent encounter. Like he walked mm -hmm. that line in a way I've never seen anyone else walk mm -hmm. it. I think we're getting there. I'm seeing people yeah. start to like figure out how to integrate it. But sure. I think he was 30 years, 40 years ahead of his time in that, mm -hmm. in that regard. So if that gets I really wish I would have had a chance to meet him. Uh, unfortunately that, that or the timing just did not work out. Uh, and I'm, I'm sad for that, but I, there are a few videos and films of him that, that uh, I have seen that are, uh, that are pretty, pretty remarkable and everything that everybody that I've talked to that has trained with him has said how remarkable he was. So um, the films that are out are, are really, um, you can find them on YouTube. They're really worth checking out because I would say that is kind of what a day-to-day -day class with Sensei would have been like. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of talk about philosophy and then he slams his ukulele on the ground and a little <laughs> bit more philosophy. And it, it, it's, it's a really good way to get to know him if you couldn't know him. Uh, sure. So we're, we're fortunate that we have those. Okay. Well, I wanted to go through and just would list the four basic principles. I, I know a number of people are, are familiar with them. I'm, I'm sure quite a few are not, especially that are not from a Tohei lineage Aikido uh, group. These were things that, that I was kind of drilled into uh, when I was up and coming. But the four points are, number one, keep your one point. Number two, relax completely. Number three, keep weight on your side. And number four, extend key. Now we're going to go into each one of these in detail. In fact, I want to hand to Oliver here to, to kind of explain uh, what he was taught by, by Sosa Sensei about what these points are. Um, but we'll get into each one in detail as we go along. So Oliver, maybe you could address that. Yeah. So when you um, mentioned that this is kind of the topic you wanted to cover, I went through all of my books by Tohei or by Tohei's students. Um, I don't have an exhaustive library, but it's not bad. Uh, mm -hmm. The earliest one from Tohei is published in 1968. And the list of four principles that you just listed off is not there. Mm -hmm. There are mentions of the principles individually, but you don't have that uh, systematic list. Mm -hmm. um, I've got, I go through a few more. 1970, Dynamic Sphere comes out. That list is not present in Dynamic Sphere. Uh, I found this book called key meditations that was given to me it came out in 1974 they are here so sometime between 1970 and 1974 we see um, a systematic approach to these principles whereas before uh, and someone might be able to correct me if they've got a better historical uh, idea but it took a while for him to sit with these before he could put them in a in a easily digestible unit at our dojo, there was a wooden sign etched on our kami saw with these four principles. Um, that, that shows you how important they were to, to at least to sensei and just kind of the, the formation of our style. And the four principles tended to, when you were receiving feedback from a senior student, it would not have been uncommon to get one of these principles offered to you as feedback either from sensei or from one of your senpai like that that was just uh kind of the language that was used so hey you know that ikkyo didn't look so great keep your one point you know or hey that kodagayashi kind of sucked so drop weight underside you know so that that was uh, a part of the communication and the feedback process as, as we were coming up and then as we go to each one, I can kind of maybe give you a little bit more context about how Sensei approached, approached sure. that. Well, and you described it just before we, we hit record here about how two of these principles are more physical and then two are more mental. Maybe you could describe that too. Yes. So uh, as I was reading through some of Tohei's literature, so you've got one, which is uh, keep one point, two, relax completely, three, keep weight on your side, and four, extend key. He says that one and four are principles of the mind, and two and three are principles of the body. So he did structure them. Um, there, there was some method to it. They weren't just here's some here's four things. He bookends the the body principles with the mental principles. So there is a sense that both of these components are important, and uh, they're balanced. There's not one body principle and 
three mental, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a balance to it. So um, as we go into it, we may find some, uh, some things that we like or don't like about the four principles, but what we can't say that it was haphazardly thrown together. It was very well thought out on how he presented them. And so when, as we approach it, we always want to make sure we go like, I know we can't know exactly what he was thinking, but perhaps this is maybe where he was headed with, with that idea. Sure. It, one thing that strikes me about, and before we get into each one specifically, that when I look at the list of the four of them, they seem to be conveying what is often referred to as the internal side of martial arts, the control of your own body, the control of your own mind, how you uh, or what you should be trying to achieve in terms of your internal aspect as opposed to the external. And it, I've yet to see a martial art that that doesn't at least get into some confusing language when it tries to describe how to do the internal part well. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say some of the Western arts probably are the most pragmatic in terms of describing it. And for that, I would point to uh, the language of boxing when they talk about how to deliver a lot of power. They don't get into kind of a mystical language or, or ambiguous. They're very physics based and they describe things like dropping weight, um, hip motions. Uh, you look to somebody like um, uh, the book Championship Fighting by Jack Dempsey. He talks about a shoulder whirl where you get the back shoulder spinning backwards as you deliver a forward punch with the forward shoulder. This is all a very physics-based descriptions. Um, and so obviously with every martial art, you have some amount of internal body discipline like how you use your muscles, how you use the weight of your body, your balance, your posture, all these things. It, there's just different languages to describe to students how to do it. And that's really the function of a teacher. A teacher needs to convey meaning from what he understands to a student who doesn't understand that. And language is how we do that. Um, and I guess that brings up point number one, which is uh, the first principle, keep one point. Uh, I don't know what a one point is. And I don't know exactly what the intention was to get there. The, the pragmatic side of me says, is the one point the center of gravity? Because it's pointed to be in the very same spot that a human being's center of gravity is. But I've heard many instructors say that a one point is more a mental or a spiritual center of the body, not specifically not a physical center of the body. Well, Again, if there's no universal agreement on what exactly a one point is, then how do you know if you've kept it or you don't? A boxer or, or, or you know, other martial artists would say, drop your weight, and this will come into the weight underside point later. But keeping your one point means exactly what? And that's, that's the dilemma. So Oliver uh, was learning about this when I, before I'd studied Aikido. So I think he can maybe illuminate what he was taught about what one point is and what keeping it is. Yeah, mileage may vary. I, <clears throat> when Sensei would talk about uh, keeping the one point, I, I am, and that is a, uh, it's a mind principle, according to Tohei. Mm -hmm. But we would also use the terminology a lot of time, move from one point. So mm -hmm. to me, uh, Sensei always talked about it, I think it was like a very physical thing. It exists inside your, your body. Now, he would and this is where things get a little bit messy because you might be talking about something in different contexts um, but use the same term um and, and so that's where things can get really muddy but for example you say you know if somebody is insulting you you want to keep your one point what he was saying was you know you don't want to tense up and you don't want to let your breathing go back you know you want to mm -hmm. you want to keep it down right mm -hmm. but then when we would move he would say like okay you know don't push with your arms move from your one point so he's using the same term, but in two different contexts. One of them is, is very physical, right? Mm -hmm. That's where you want to move. From. You're not moving from your upper body, but you're moving from your core. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one is very much in a mental or an emotional. It's like, don't let somebody throw you mentally off balance or emotionally off balance. You know, you want to stay centered at one point. So it starts to sound real esoteric and it gets real confusing when you're using it in two different contexts. But... Um, it was never confusing when he would say it. I, I feel like context really was the key. You know, what, what mm -hmm. are we talking about somebody yelling at you 
Or are we talking about somebody trying to yank you from your shoulder off balance? Because we would do that all the time. This guy's going to yank you off balance. Keep your one point, you know, as you move. But what he's saying is, you know, keep your structure, keep your, um, I mean, he didn't use those terms, but, you know, keep your structure, keep your alignment. So I'm more inclined to, to say it's like what you said. It's a center of gravity. But then I guess you could also go, well, there's an emotional center of gravity too, but sure. it, it's similar. And as long as you understand the context you're talking about, it's fine. I think the issue comes down when you're talking about an emotional center of gravity or an emotional mm -hmm. one point, And then you start talking about it in physical terms. Like we're not talking about the same thing anymore. You know, right. and that's, and that that's part of the problem different. of language when you use one term to describe two very different things. And mm -hmm. this is a, a technique uh, from teaching. I think they call it tagging where let's say you've got a student who's habitually doing something bad with their footwork and you say, okay, here's what I want you to do. Like, let's say they're rolling the back foot and the outside's coming up and their knees collapsing. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to push your knees outward and I want you to stand flat on that back, back foot. Rather than having to make that description every time you say, I'm gonna use the term blueberry. When I say blueberry, I mean, push the knees out, put the foot back down, yeah. like all of that stuff, all that language goes into that one word. And I just chose blueberry to be, you know, arbitrary. But if one point is the same thing, like there's a big description that goes behind one point. I just use that word so that I don't have to do a full description every time I say you've lost your one point, like calm your body, shift your, you know, shift your, your weight, shift your mind, get yourself focused. All of that stuff goes into that one point term just as a as like a shorthand would that make sense if you hit stop record right now i feel like we'd be done because i think <laughs> most of the problems with the four principles come down to that is we sure. are cramming really complex ideas into as little language as possible mm -hmm. um which is helpful sometimes it's helpful till it's not right. um and like any tool it's useful for some things it. and it's not useful for other things and it's you use the, the right That's tool exactly for the right. wrong job and you're just an idiot <laughs> it does you're ineffective um, so so to your point okay so when sensei would say keep one point what he was really saying was keep your balance okay mm -hmm. and if you're saying move from your one point he's saying move from a place of balance now you could use that in a physical context or you could use that in an emotional context and it means the same thing but it is not the same thing but they're interrelated right so if you're under attack mm -hmm. you want to keep your one point well you want to keep your balance but you want to keep your emotional balance too right because if you flip mm -hmm. out maybe you um you can't respond correctly maybe you respond uh, with more force than necessary because you're coming from an emotional place so mm -hmm. you you could see how how muddy it could get how quick because mm -hmm. the concepts are interrelated um and especially if you're talking about like a, a violent encounter the mm -hmm. emotional mental and physical they are very much tied <laughs> so you know you are you are having a very similar um uh, language for all of those things but at and the end of the day yeah. when he was oh go ahead no go ahead you're on a roll when, when he said keep one point i i feel like we all understood it to mean maintain your bounce whether that be emotional mental or, or physical sure. but again that's shorthand we knew it because we were there and we heard it and we could put the context together and i think if there's a downside to shorthand it, it can be that a teacher can assume that a student understands what the shorthand means and might be mistaken mm -hmm. and over time misunderstandings that are allowed to keep going without you under uh, really comprehending that a student may not have a full grasp of what the shorthand stands for can lead to misunderstandings over time and, and i think distortions amplify over time if they're not fully clarified um and i felt so this too where, where each time new students come in you have to make sure that, I, that you're describing these terms and elaborating what they're supposed to be I was at a, a workshop a few years back with a wonderful Aikido instructor. I had, I had so much fun. It was such a great workshop, but he kept talking. Um, he would talk about things and he'd go one point, one point like this. And he kept, he kept making this, this sign right there. And I was like, what, what is he talking? I think he means make your one point small. Uh, 
But like after the third day of the workshop, I realized like what he meant was when you're grabbing, you're concentrating on this one point. Like it had nothing to do with what I thought it was. He literally meant just this one point right here, you know? And I was going like, (laughs) this is right here, you know? And I was going, okay, wait, do we shrink it? Is it, what what has happened? Because we had a shorthand Mm -hmm. and that was not shorthand. That was just words, right? But I started to impose my shorthand onto this thing. And it took me three days to like, just figure out, oh, the grip would be better if I was doing this one thing that he was talking about. So sure. to your point, yeah, it, it's difficult. It's, it's a tricky tool to deal with. Um, mm-hmm. And actually that leads us right to number two, which is relax completely. If you get a literal student, and I've had many new students, especially <laughs> children, like the younger they are, they will take this so literally, you say relax completely and they collapse on the ground. And they're like, or they just go completely floppy. Mm-hmm. They still remain standing, but that's where what does relax completely what is the the shorthand that it represents and Mm -hmm. where i've come to it i've i've admittedly i have drifted away from using this language to describe these principles Mm -hmm. i prefer describing relax the muscles that you don't need to use don't use excessive tension or strength or or energy relax everything that doesn't need to be there Um, and the language that i found that is the most successful with students is what I think it was Michelangelo was asked, you know, how do you create these beautiful sculptures? It's like, I just look at the rock and I remove all the rock that does not need to be there. And the, the beauty of the art is revealed underneath. So that's really from a, from a movement standpoint, what we are doing is carving away the extra tension that does not need to be there to find the maximum efficiency for a movement. Um, but relax completely tends to be almost an oversimplification like the shorthand doesn't really suit because when you look at the literal translation unlike one point where there isn't really a literal translation relax completely kind of means be flopped it means something right yeah yeah yeah, it it does mean something well and and so when sensei would teach this um and again he he was teaching from these principles constantly Uh, Mm -hmm. you would not go a class without hearing these things employed maybe not all of them all the time but Mm -hmm. employed in some fashion so the way he would do this was a very physical demonstration he would get his uke up there and he would shake his hand he said relax completely does not mean this right that's that that would be socially limp or floppy yeah yeah and it doesn't mean this you know that would be socially unacceptable there's a there's a middle ground right Mm -hmm. but it was almost like even at that point there was clarification necessary Mm-hmm. At no point did Sensei, and I have to assume it's just through experience, like, like, like all of us, right? All of us have that floppy person, right? Mm-hmm. So through experience, he, he realized like this demands clarification. You can't just say this. They're not going to get it. So anytime he used that term, I mean, almost to the, to the time, he would give that type of demonstration. Not like this, not like this. There's a middle ground in there. So, mm-hmm. I mean... It's hard to argue, you know, that was 30 years ago or something like that. Like, and even then it needed some help. So I think you're right on on that one. Well, and, and I think teaching is like any technology. You cannot just take a freeze time from the past and say, this is the pinnacle of teaching technology. You know, any more than you drive a Model A around and say, this is the pinnacle of automotive development. Like that's, uh, you know, kind of absurd. Um, and I, and I think that this is where that unbendable arm demonstration or exercise, or I call it a drill really, does point out you can keep that arm straight because you're only using the muscles that you need and you've relaxed the other ones. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that many people view the unbendable arm like a lot of the key exercises sort of be like harder tricks. And you can certainly use them as, as such depending on how you present them. And some Aikido instructors tend to tend to do that. That's all they use them for. But to me, it's a very physical explanation. And usually I describe that as if you hold your arm out and you tense up your muscles, you have two opposing muscle groups that are pulling against one another. If someone comes up and tries to bend them, they're using half of your muscle groups to fight against the other half. So you're giving your the person bending your arm half of your muscles to work to bend your arm. Whereas if you extend out, you've relaxed the, the contraction muscles so they don't have those to work with, it's harder to bend the arm. It's not impossible, uh, but 
I've, I've had tremendous success with having that demonstration, let people understand what it's like to relax certain muscles that maybe your brain thinks you're going to be stronger if you fire them and they're, they're all, you know, you're using tremendous strength. So it's selectively relax. Exactly. To me, that's I, a more accurate description than relax completely. I, I, I agree. And again, there's a, there's possibly a language barrier. There's, um, you know, it's difficult to say why he chose that one completely. Mm -hmm. You could say relax, and I think mm -hmm. it would have been pretty effective. Sure. You say relax completely. I don't know. I, I you know, because we weren't there, and you know, I never mm -hmm. had the, the privilege of talking to him. Why that? You know, because mm -hmm. again, that one demands uh, clarification. Mm -hmm. So, and you kind of bring up. You know, we'll tackle it when we get to the end because I, I do want to talk about unbendable arm, and that's a perfect number four. Um, mm -hmm. But you see people rediscovering these these ideas, you know, now. So you're like, there's something to it because people keep yeah. coming back to sure. them. You know, they're not, but the language is sometimes different. And, and in fact, if you ever look at um, like any of the invisible jujitsu stuff that Hicks and Gracie kind of teach. Mm -hmm. And you see their instructors try to articulate what they're doing. It looks like an Aikido demonstration. We're yep. all stumbling over the same language. We're like, mm -hmm. no, it's like you're relaxed, but no, not like that. Like, like yeah. better. No, that's too. We're all in the same boat because right. we know kinesthetically what we're trying to do, but the language is just tricky. No matter whether you're doing jujitsu or Aikido, or I mean, I've never done Tai Chi, but I imagine Tai Chi guys are probably running into the same. I imagine a boxing coach is having the same thing. Relax. Yeah, absolutely. No, not like that. You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, we're all in the same spot. Exactly. It, that, that internal side, I think, is a, is a very strong part of martial arts. I don't think you can get to be a superb martial artist without addressing it somehow. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I don't, I've yet to see that there's a very clean language. There's really just rough language to try to get a student sort of close so that he can discover it for himself. Absolutely. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, we just got to ballpark them, right? Because ultimately, they can regurgitate what we're saying, but th they're the ones that have got to figure it out. So if we could just get them in the ballpark so they could do it, I mean, that's exactly. That's good and if there was one defense for the 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 key exercises, at least that I've experienced as an instructor, is that is the, the those key development uh, or examples are tangible, tactile things that a student can feel rather than just listening to your words. Because the words, like you said, it can be very confusing, misleading. If the language you're using isn't something that resonates with a student, it's going to go right over their head. And most of these go right over a student's head. Um, yeah, at at the, least and after we get done with the four, I, I would love to talk about some of the key testing because we... we yeah, let's, uh, let me write we'll, that we'll down make sure that. we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the tangible part actually brings us to our next point, which is to keep weight underside. If there was one of the four of these that seems to have the best description or clearest is, and this is what was shown to me, my instructor would hold up a Joe and they say, okay, you know, and he'd set it down on the ground and he said, where is the weight on the Joe? Like what part of it? And of course, anybody would say, well, it's the weight that's on the bottom. Like that's where, because of gravity, the weight's going straight down. The weight is on the under, what's that's on the underside of the, of the Joe. Which, of course, brought to mind my question, which I didn't utter in class, of course, but it went on in my head is like, well, how does it not? How do you get the weight to the top side of the Joe? Like, can it only not go go down because of that's how gravity works? And and this is the one once you start to penetrate that, like, OK, now you're talking about the student's relationship between his body and gravity and the earth and you're talking about manipulating that so here's where we get to that shorthand part what exactly does weight underside mean i think a boxer would talk about dropping their weight they talk about things like sitting into a punch to me that's the practice of keeping your weight underside which is dropping your weight at the right time doing it in the right method uh when you need it and maybe you could illuminate if there is some other descriptions of weight underside that would be relevant so i'm gonna i'm gonna take a slight tangent because there's something I, I i don't know if you were ever uh taught in this manner uh but this is something that uh, all of my senior i say all of my, 
I had several seniors who would talk about uh, the four principles in this way. And they would say, if you have one, you have all four. And if you lose one, you've probably, you've, you've lost all four. They wouldn't say it probably. They said you've lost all four. Have you, did you guys ever have that conversation at all? It rings a bell, but it was not something that got brought up okay. regularly. In fact, even, even that logic, I questioned, like if you have one, then you have all four, but how can you lose one then? Okay, so I think it's this one. I think it's this okay. book, this key meditations book. I, I went, I read a lot of stuff last night, so I can't be certain <laughs> that. But, but it's in here. So sure. at, at some point, this is a Tohei thing. Oh no 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 no! It's in this book. It's in this book right here. Yes, it's one of Tohei's students. So this book is published in 1984. So it's ten years after the one where we see the four principles. So okay. this is definitely a Tohei thing. Mm -hmm. But the idea of weight underside. Okay, what would make it not? fall to the bottom muscle tension muscle tension will support the weight high right mm -hmm. so now you're f i guess the probably the way we would probably discuss is now you're fighting gravity like gravity which lets you have come down but now we're fighting gravity well that takes mm -hmm. effort right mm -hmm. now that takes that's going to eat into your efficiency that's going to eat into your speed that's going to eat into your power if you are fighting gravity mm -hmm. so to, so how does this all interact when you relax completely or relax, right, the muscle tension goes. So it allows the weight to be undisturbed, right, would, would be kind of what we're trying to do. And then it's a process. It's not a, a light switch, right? You're just trying to figure it out. Like, oh, I had tension in my shoulder. I did not know about, you know, which is another good reason we should do key testing is it's a calibration tool because we're always focused on what it's doing to the other guy. And we're not spending enough time to figuring out like, Oh, I, I'm holding my elbow like super tight. And I didn't know that because it's never been tested. You know, I just walk around like this. So since they talked a lot about the, the relaxation, well, that allows the weight to settle where it's supposed to go. Now, how can you lose one? If imagine you're pretty well relaxed, you're not fighting gravity, weight settle, and some dude kicks your door in and yells at you, you're going to go, <gasps> everything shoots up right? The muscle tension hits, the breathing stops, center gravity shoots up. Well, now you definitely didn't keep your one point. One point's gone, whether physical or emotional or both, probably both, right? Some do kick my door and both are gone. Um, you're definitely not relaxing correctly. Relax correctly should probably be the right way to say that instead of- Yeah, that, that's a, that'd be good language. That would probably be better, but whatever. So you're definitely not relaxing completely. And then you're definitely not gonna be able to keep your weight underside because everything just shot up. Right. Mm -hmm. So we would always talk about those things and what it was helpful for as an instructor when I did start teaching. If the student understood the shorthand, that's a big if, but if mm -hmm. it did make good feedback mechanism, because you mm -hmm. would go, uh, this dude's trying to do Ikkyo from up here. So, mm -hmm. hey, buddy, relax. Well, the weight's going to drop. The weight's going to go underside. Right. Mm -hmm. Or if maybe it wasn't quite as tense, but maybe he's locked in and said, hey, put your weight underside. Well, you're going to relax. You have to relax to allow that to happen. So you can kind of tailor make your feedback to what you were seeing the student do. So, uh, but again, as long as they understood what you were saying, then, mm -hmm. then it did make an effective feedback tool. But I've never had somebody day one, week one, month one, come in and go, wait on your side. And then they're like, get it. Like, that's not going to happen. Like there's a, there's a learning curve where you try to figure out like, what is that? What does that mean? So yeah, uh, in uh, keeping your attention to not have students get lost in the cracks who don't get the, the explanation is that's you got to take care when using shorthand language like that. So, so to the to the to the point of, of keep weight underside, it I think you're right. Dropping into a paunch, um, if you're gonna throw somebody, not keeping yourself up here, but you know, allow, let your weight sit on. Even in, if you hear like boxers or, or tie boxers when they get in the clinch, they always talk about lay your weight on the other guy, mm -hmm. right? Make him hold you up. <laughs> you don't hold up. You know, you let him, his structure holds you up. Well, that's weight underside. Um, that would be a, a practical application of it, mm -hmm. a practical application of it. But it, uh, it is, if you were working in this model, each one is kind of contingent on the others. And if you lose one or you're missing one, you might want to diagnose a different one up or down the chain to go, ah, eh, this could be, this could be problematic. Sure. And we that, have, that diagnosis is an important part in, in 
the way that I tend to teach is more like a coach. I like to have my students know the fundamentals of what they're doing. So when something goes wrong, they can troubleshoot it themselves rather than waiting for me to come over and necessarily point it out to them because I might miss it. I might be working with somebody else. Mm -hmm. To me, that's one of those sort of self, self sustaining practices that a good martial artist should learn. And, and I think they should start on the process earlier rather than later. And so diagnosis or, and self-diagnosis, I think, is, is very important. Um, it's huge. Yeah, it's yeah, huge. It is. And, and having that list, as, as muddy as it can sometimes be, if everyone's on the same page, you, your UK could tell you, hey, man, you need to drop weight underside and maybe, maybe get you. Is it the best way? I don't know. Probably not. Right. But, mm -hmm. but it's something. I'll tell you what it's not. It's my least favorite I, I, it's a, I, I, it hits pet peeve level for me. It's my least favorite way to learn Aikido or anything probably, but Aikido is you're working with an UK and they're, they know what you're going to do. Cause the sensei just showed everybody, we're all going to do the same thing. And they lock down on, you, right. Cause they know what's coming. And then they go, well, you need to move your pinky over here and you need to be your big toe over there and your knees not in the right spot and your shoulder. And then when you deform your body into what they do, think it should be they just go flying over like ha, there it is you nailed it so we spent 10 minutes doing this thing that let's face it, is not right that's not going to work like that's not going to work under pressure that's not going to even work here the only reason it works is because you're letting me do it you know um i am no closer to being able to fix that problem the next rep unless i conform to that list of 100 things again right. where is if somebody just said um let's take um Let's take, keep one point. Hey man, you're, you're, you're out of alignment. Get your alignment back. Mm -hmm. Every rep, that's something you can check, you know, or relax complete. Oh, man, I'm tense again. You know, it's mm -hmm. quick. It's over in two seconds and you're back to repping. You're back sure. to training instead of having being lectured over this really contrived way of, of doing a technique that it, it's, you know, it's useless, it's useless, uh, uh, waste of training time. You know, you know, I share in that same pet peeve. In fact, <clears throat> I've kind of labeled that as psychotic instructor behavior, um, which is or, or control freak of, you know, I'm going to I know what you're going to do. I'm going to stop you from doing it. As long as you adhere to what I demand of you, I will comply. And um, I've busted so many instructors doing that same thing. And they've done it to me. I've seen it do, do them to other people. It really isn't a learning tool as much as it is a dominance tool. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's that sliding into cult-like behavior where you are, I, I don't think it's effective teaching and I've rejected, uh, you know, doing that, uh, partially because I realize when it's done to you, uh, it really is not productive, except for creating acolyte type attitude mm -hmm. behavior. Um, and for me, I don't know, maybe not everybody's like this, but I don't want acolytes. I want talented martial artists that are at my level and higher. Like I, I tell all my students, like, I want you as good as Aikido as I am, if not even better. I want to get to the point where I'm learning from you. Right. And, and from that, not just learning by observation, but learning from their insights, like, and that's a huge thing. And unfortunately, you know, there are martial art instructors out there that that's not what they're there for. They're not there for the excellence of their students. They're there for their own kind of ego and to make themselves look, you know, like big shots. And that's what you describe as your pet peeve is one of the methods I've seen that, that does exactly that. Um, it's kind of meant to demean people. And I, I don't care for that myself, but. Um, well, and it's, it's not a principle-based approach, right? right? It's technical, mm -hmm. even and I've never had this happen, but even mm -hmm. if somebody approached it that way and was correct, I would not be able to replicate it. So right. how is that helpful? Right. So you have to have a, in my, this, just uh, my two cents, you have the, whether we like this list or not that Tohei brought to the table, mm -hmm. he did take a principle based approach. And that so, I like, I consider myself a principle based instructor. Like, I would hope to be, you know, I want yeah. to be, I catch myself sometimes going like, well, that, how's that going to help that guy? Like, if he doesn't remember that thing you just said, how's that going to help mm -hmm. him? Sure. So, you know, we, we try um, mm -hmm. modeling ourselves after Tohei's uh, 
you know, he came before us and he was bringing a system of diagnosis, correction, um, that you could just go back and consult. Like, okay, I'm having trouble here. There's four things that I have to keep in mind. That's so different than saying there's a thousand things you have to keep in, in mind, you know, like where all this stuff goes. Mm -hmm. And it's like you've said before, I know we've had this conversation, your students will figure it out. If you give them a principle, um, they'll move their elbow in the right place. They'll bend their knees. They'll, they'll move to the right angle. If you've given them just something they can kind of play with. But if you tell it has to be here and you have to be here and you have to be here, they're not going to be able to replicate that. And if, and I know you and I both share the same issue. When we go like, how, how long should it take you to be functional in Aikido? Uh, about a decade. Why? Why? Exactly. Why? What, what is going on? Tohei was teaching military and police academies six months after starting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a story, and I love this story too. I don't know if there's a point to it. I like this story. Um, <laughs> Wait so on. I'll tell it to you. Uh, he's uh, in Chicago. He's doing a workshop. And uh, these guys come in from Ohio and uh, they start doing techniques and he's watching them. And he goes, where did you guys learn that? And he goes, well, we, we bought one of your books. And so he goes, I could see no discernible fault in their technique. Well, they just figured it out. If you just let people play with stuff, they will mm -hmm. figure it out, you know? Right. And uh, I think whether you're using Tohei's four principles or some other principle-based model, you're going to see a faster retention of the information. And it, more importantly, you're going to see creativity and problem solving. Sure. And that's kind of what's, what's all about, right? Is creating problem solvers. <clears throat> so, you know, and, and I got to give uh, Tohei credit and granted, I think that this list could use a little bit of tweaking for language and improvement, but you're absolutely right. And it, I also reflect the fact that his teacher had no system. There was nothing except here watch me and then mm -hmm. now you go do so i i would give tohei a great deal of credit for trying to come up with a system a replicatable yes set of criteria that could be passed on from teacher to student and used in a constructive way like mm -hmm. that's what a teacher does and i and i would likewise credit uh jiguro kano for being mm -hmm. what the innovations he brought to the martial arts uh kenji tomiki uh, even uh, Goza Shioda, they brought a systematized, and I believe Tamiki was a professional teacher, as was Kano. Yes. So they, mm -hmm. they had an occupational background that explains why they wanted a system, not just to say, hey, I'm great, watch me and do, do, do like I do. Um, so these guys, I think, brought really good innovations, not to say that they were the final word in the, the technology of teaching this martial art, but they provided some good groundwork um, mm -hmm. and necessary groundwork. It's just, you know, can, can somebody, can we start to stand on the shoulders of giants and bring that even forward even farther and refine it right, even right. more? And I, and I think we can, as long as, you know, we don't get to the point where our idol worship of these men is such that we say we could never do anything as good as they can. You right, know, right. otherwise we'd be driving Model A's around because nobody would be able to outdo Henry Ford. So um, I guess that brings us to the, the monster of the, of the four principles, the last one. And, and we've talked before we, we hit the record button here about this one was going to be a big uh, extend key. And this brings up, if there was one word, I think, in the martial arts that is so ambiguous and misunderstood and argued and bickered about, it's, the, it's key. Like, what does it mean? Um, I know... Aikidoists argue about what is Aiki. Well, key is part of Aiki. If you don't, you can argue about I and you can argue about key, but key is one of those things that is, I have yet to hear a clear explanation or practical or pragmatic explanation of what exactly key is. But what I have heard, kind of like the psycho instructor who will always tell you, whatever it is you think it is, it's not that. But I know what it is. I know what it is. I know, yeah, I know yeah, what it is, but yeah. you can't. Like you can and you won't for. 25 years you can study and you can try to learn but you'll never get it and boy if there was one my pet peeve that one would be it is don't tell me i'm an idiot don't tell your students that you're smart and they're all dumb and that this thing that you claim to understand you can't explain it because in my book if you can't explain something you don't get it you really don't understand it but 
that's uh, that's just venting my that's own. Your, yeah, that's okay. We'll, the that's last it. half of it. The safe thing to make is that. That's what we'll that's do for it. the rest of the thing. No, no. I'm, that's, <laughs> but but then if you don't understand key, then how the hell do you extend it? So I guess that's yeah. the the underlying question. Yeah. So uh, again, I'll go back to the way. So I don't teach this list anymore. I teach the things on this list, but I don't teach this list. And that describes exactly my approach to yeah. what I found through trial and error. But having talked to you recently, uh, when, we, when we spoke, uh, you know, wrote last night, I, I realized if it wasn't for number four, I probably would. Because okay. I can explain one through three in about a minute to everybody. Keep one point. Hey, dude, just keep your balance. If you're out of balance, you don't have your one point. You know, um, mm -hmm. relax correctly is probably what I would say. You know, re relax mm -hmm. appropriately. I could tell you, I could talk to you in about two minutes and get you there. Um, weight undersets, like you said, you, you do a simple demonstration. Be you heavy. Have, be heavy. Yeah, you want to be heavy. It's If someone was trying to lift you up and throw you in a van, would it be better to be light or heavy? All right, let's, let's work on getting heavy, you know? Mm -hmm. Four keeps me from teaching the list. Mm -hmm. um, because I would spend the first five minutes talking the first three and the next 10 years talking about number four um, <laughs> because of how, you know, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking, I'd just be arguing with everybody about, you know, mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. The way Sensei approached it, in all honesty, was similar to the way that most Aikido practitioners approach it. He would we would do a minimal arm. We would do um, some walking exercises. Um, but again, I think it's kind of shorthand for a lot of really complex things that you're just trying to, to jam into one, one word. Um, in a little bit, I'm going to get really outside my lane and I'm going to tell you what I think it is now. Like, but I'm not, I, I'm not there here because I want to talk a little bit about why it's problematic and it, everyone knows what's problematic when i'm talking to you i had a um i had a, several years ago we had somebody visiting our, our school and uh he was training with one of our one of our i would, I would call her one of our senior students for sure and after class she came up to me she said so this guy just said that like, like on that last technique i didn't i needed to breathe in his key more so like what what is all that and i kind of just said yeah listen that's nonsense. Like, don't listen to it. But the frustrating thing was I knew exactly what he meant, right? Because I knew what he meant. And I was like, so mad at myself for it. And, and I, you realize it's, it's partially nonsense, but it's partially jargon, right? Because I knew what he meant. What he meant was you need to draw the person out off their base a little bit. You know, you need to bait them more so that their balance is gone. So you can bring them down. It's like, I, but why wouldn't you just say that? Because if you said that, you'd be done in 10 seconds and, and the person would have improved the next rep. You tell somebody, well, you need to breathe in my key. Well, now I need to know what key is. I need to know what you mean. Then I need to know how do, how do I breathe it? Why am I breathing it? What if I don't want to breathe, <laughs> right? Like it, there's just all these things. Whereas if you just said, hey, back up another half inch, you, you'll take my balance, throw me down. You know, you'd be done. So um, I know what they mean a lot of times. And I, and I know you're in the same boat. Like, you know what people are talking about. But a day one, week one, month student is not going to get it, which now you've added six months to a year to their training before they're getting any benefit out of it. So and, and I just the, don't use that word anymore. I agree with you. And in fact, the danger that I've seen, and I admit that long ago in the past, I tried to work with these terms to try to get some understanding with them. And I observed not only firsthand, but secondhand, the danger of this particular tool or using this shorthand this way is that it's easy for the student to misunderstand and then feel ashamed like he, he should understand, but he doesn't. And mm -hmm. therefore he does not want to ask. He doesn't want to say, Sensei, I don't get it when you say breathe in key. I don't just help me understand that. Yeah. He'll say, I'm a bad student because I don't get this. I'll just and wait actually, until some later time where maybe it'll be explained to me, but I don't want to look like a fool in front of my students. I don't want my, my, my sensei berate me and have to stop the class and explain it like I'm a moron. It, it's also shorthand for an instructor to kind of just say, I'm done talking. 
extend your key and I'm going to go over here and th that's it. Mm -hmm. And so like you, this number four, I've got a big problem with not necessarily that it, like you said, that it has no meaning whatsoever. It just opens the door for all kinds of not so for poor inter exchanges between a student and a teacher. Um, now I will say too, and I'm going to add this, that I have experienced what extended key is back when I was competing, there were people and you could kind of, you read their body language and you read kind of, you read their mind and their intention. And this is something that, you know, old classic swordsman talked about, <clears throat> but I got to feel what that's like. I can see, and I can feel when somebody's just their brain is scrambled. They, they're not really thinking straight. You mm -hmm. look at them and you can walk up to them, you know, in, in a ring or in a competition field. And you can say, I've got my focus and your brain is all over the universe. Yeah. I could walk right up to you nose to nose and I would feel no threat whatsoever. Like to me, that's maybe you could describe it as your key is all over the universe. It's not focused. You're not ready. You have nothing there. On the other end of the spectrum, I've seen people from 30 yards away that look like a threat and they feel like it. You feel like you've walked into their, their zone, like walking into a lion's den. Just because the lion's 20 feet away from you doesn't mean that you are not under direct threat. And I can't explain it. I, I wouldn't know how to replicate that. I don't know how to teach it to somebody. I don't even know if it can be taught or, or articulated, but I can say that I've felt it where, you know, even though you're well outside of somebody's reach or their, their practical range, you still feel like they are in control, like they're almost like their ego has spread out into a larger area than their physical body can. And right. boy, I wish, I wish I could, I put, put down how to, how to develop that or how to do it. Um, I think it's, again, it's weird. To Tohei's credit mm -hmm. was he did believe, and I agree with him, I agree with him. Whatever that thing is, and we'll, and it's not mysterious. If we can kind of get into them, because I think again we're looking at ten different things, right, right? That we're just trying to like shove into one concept. But one thing that Tohei believed that I believe is that you can develop. Let's just say you can develop yourself. Mm -hmm. These things are skills; they can be improved upon. And not only that, he he didn't just hand a list out and then call it a day. He developed a list. And then he developed drills and he called them tests that you could utilize to see where you were. Like, I know I'm, I'm, I, I play ball in your uh, forum, Aikido the mm -hmm. Marshall side. I assume yeah. anyone who's watching this knows Aikido the Marshall side, yeah. but maybe you don't, maybe you've never been. It is the only forum I will play ball in. Um, but Which I love your post, by the way, when you, when you comment you. in there, it's great. Yeah, well, like I said, it's the only one I'll, I'll, I'll do, you know, um, because of the community, you guys have done such a good job of making sure the community stays um, civil, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, on, and on topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And on top, it's, easy, it's <laughs> easy for Facebook groups to go completely careening off into the universe. You got, we, you guys are very focused, which is what I appreciate. But one of the things, the conversation that happens all the time, and I think it happened this morning, I believe was, um, testing you know sometimes we use the term pressure testing sometimes we call it resistant mm -hmm. pump tohei did bring that to the table it's just in a different context i have one thing we i think we have not talked about that is super important the four principles of mind body unification are not aikido specific there is a right. black belt magazine interview with tohei and it's uh profiling this baseball player baseball that player. Tohei, tohei helped and Tohei okay. increased this guy's batting power, like, I don't know, a million percent, whatever, you know, he like, he really helped him mm -hmm. out. And they said, oh, so Tohei is Aikido good for baseball players? Is Aikido is not good for baseball players. The key in Aikido is good for baseball players. So he did make a distinction that there's this skill set over here that can be applied to any avenue. And then there's this Aikido over here, which will benefit from this because this benefits everything. Sure. So you can kind of see where people start to lose their martial edge because if you're a pr if you're really examining the key principles over here you've removed this thing from the martial context well you'll never wind up back there again until you plug some martial stuff back into it you know what i mean so mm -hmm. one of my favorite martial artists on the 
on the plane, I, I really love his uh, contribution is uh, Tony Blower. I think Tony mm-hmm. Blower has essentially, I, I hope if he ever sees this or any of his people see this, I hope this is uh, considered out of line because I mean it with the utmost respect. It's like he recreated Aikido from the ground up. Mm-hmm. So uh, for those who are familiar with him, you know, he does, um, you know, uh, finger splay. Keep going. I'm just going to get my charging cable. Keep talking. Go for it, my friend. Go for it. Yeah. So he goes up uh, finger splay outside 90. Well, that's a really quick way to say extend key. You know, at least it does the same thing. Um, and then he pressure tests it by having someone try to punch his head off. And will his unbendable arm survive somebody trying to throw a haymaker at your head? So he basically, he does the unbendable arm thing, just like we do. And then he pressure tests it by having somebody swing at him. And you're like, well, now you've got both. You've got the key test. Can you bend the arm? And then you've got a martial test. And can you integrate those two things? He uses this term um, sometimes uh make sure I get this right, core to extremity movement. Mm -hmm. Well, doesn't that kind of sound like move from your center? Core to extremity? I mean, doesn't that sound like move from your center, you know? And And so you could could also toss uh, Shoto Seizu in there, control the first move. That that explosion that he teaches, to me, just screams Shoto Seizu. And when you see his his micro fights, you you see the guys Mm -hmm. in the suits and stuff, and, uh, you know, you'll see guys throw these, these haymakers, and they're charging in, they're trying to tackle... And almost to the one, you'll see somebody do a kaitanagi. And almost every single one of those, you'll see them do a kaitanagi or some sort of kokunagi. It's like he rebuilt Aikido using the scientific method. But what happens is when you don't put it in that martial context, then you can do the key tests and you'll get good at that stuff, but you'll never be able to plug it back into a martial context unless you're exploring the martial context you know and i think uh larry renosa talks about that same concept too he does yes you know which i totally agree with um that was a great interview by the way i really enjoyed oh that thanks interview. yeah i really like yeah. talking with with sensei renosa that was that was a lot of fun yeah so um, uh, yeah as we as we look at all of these four principles mm-hmm. um if you teach them at your dojo who you know whoever's watching this if you teach them at your dojo as long as your students know what you're talking about, I can't fault you for mm-hmm. it. You just have to do diligence to know that they understand what you're saying. So again, I don't use this language anymore, but I know, I know it all to be true. I know that mm-hmm. if you're relaxed, you're faster, you're more powerful, you feel better. You know, mm-hmm. I know that if you're in alignment and you're moving in alignment, that's better for you. So I, you know, I use these things. I just don't use them in this, in this format. Yeah. You know, my students and I always joke about, I should paint the word relax and the word breathe up on the wall because we use those words so much because really martial art training. And I, I think all martial arts are probably this way. You're just trying to carve away all that extra tension that you don't absolutely, and all the extra strength. So relaxing. And, and if you can't breathe and I, I'm a little surprised, I never thought about it just before this moment, but I don't see breathing anywhere on this list. Whereas breathing is so crucial to everything. You can't do any of this stuff if you're not breathing correctly. So if you look through some of his books or books mm-hmm. of his students, I have this just like crazy pile here. I mean, this is not exhaustive, yeah. but I've got this pile sure. here. And I was going through all this. Mm-hmm. He teaches breathing uh, pretty extensively, but it's a method of developing the principles. So it's not an end game in and of itself. And again, I'm speaking out of turn right. because I don't know how he intended it. But it seems to me that the four are the end game. And then mm-hmm. you have a lot of drills to get to the end game. So sure. breathing would be one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, medita- meditation types, key tests. Key tests are not the end game. Mm-hmm. They're designed to pressure test whether you're actually developing these things or not. They're methods of developing the end game. Um mm-hmm. You know, he's separating the content from the training method. So breathing would be a training method, you know. So, for example, if you could breathe really well, like you had really good control of your breath, in and of itself, it's nothing. But if that allowed you to stay calm under pressure, that training method is now paying off, you know. Um, So anyway, that's kind of my take on, on, on that. that Yeah, you know, and I I wanted to bring this up and, and clarify this at the end here that 
I've got uh, the utmost respect for Koichi Tohei. I think he brought tremendous innovations to Aikido. I think he was arguably one of the one of the top Aikido practitioners of his of his era. I wouldn't say he was the best, but how are you ever going to know who was exactly yeah. the best? But he was one of the premiers, uh, and he went above and beyond the call to try to teach and make what he knew how to do uh, skills that he could pass on to other people. And I have a great deal of respect for that. That said, I think that like Oliver, I don't use this language when I teach either, just because I've not seen that it's that it resonates with students. I've found other language to, to convey these points with language that works a little better. And I've not found any one particular language that works with every student, but sort of some variations that different students can resonate with and they can start to understand. Where I felt the most appreciation is from students who will tell me, thank you for speaking clearly and describing this in a way that I can get and, mm -hmm. and not using you know weird language that sounds somehow supernatural or esoteric or I, I, don't, I don't get it. Um, I like when students leave a class and they go, okay, I, I, I get, I understand more than I did when I started this class. Not with, oh boy, I have no idea what you just described or, you know, I'm more confused. And unfortunately, you know, not to say that Aikido is worse than anything else for this or any other art. I think everybody, every art has its own methods, some of which are more practical, others are more confusing. Um, and, and as a teacher, I like finding those methods, regardless of what art teaches them, of how can I get my students enjoying learning and learn faster than wasting their time, my time, and having to tell them they got to wait 10 years before they have any practical skill. So, and I, f I found that that good teaching will, will bring that clarity. And, you know, when I run across instructors that, that use language that's, that lacks clarity, that always raises a red flag to me. Like it either means they're, they're maybe not a good teacher and there's plenty of martial artists out there that are not very good teachers, uh, or they are there for something other than to spread understanding. And unfortunately there's, there are those instructors out there too. And, you know, I, I don't really want to go out of my way to keep their company. I'd much rather be, you know, in a room like you, Oliver, because I know when you and I have trained together, we're all about, let's get down to, get down to the, you know, the brass tacks here. Let's get some understanding. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm always thankful to run across martial artists like you and, and, and people with that attitude, because you get so much more out of the time. You can take 10 minutes and walk away with a gem. Absolutely. And, you know, whereas I've worked with people for hours and not walked away with anything because they're just, they, they're, they lack the clarity and they, and whenever you want to pin them down on something, they, they're elusive. They use language that kind of avoids getting to understand what they're talking about or what they're doing or, or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and it's always better when you can enjoy learning. Absolutely. And to me, that's the duty of an instructor. And so I, I, I think that, that Tohei really, he did a great service to Aikido and teaching it. Um, but I will also say that I'm, that I'm honest, that I'm disappointed in how he drifted off into woo-woo land as he got older. And maybe he just got bored with, with the martial aspect of Aikido and, and wanted to get so into the key stuff that... Um, you know, he, he drifted the way that he did and that, and then obviously led the key society into drifting into, frankly, I don't even know what it is. I mean, every time that I ran across key society instructors, practitioners, or, or went to their seminars and stuff, there was very little physical art really going on there. It was all kind of these key trick things. And I could see the practicality from an internal aspect it felt like the an aikido version of a tai chi mm -hmm. class and I, and and i even do a disservice to tai chi by describing that because i have met combative tai chi practitioners there's not many of them Absolutely. and i'm sure for every one of those there's probably a thousand you know 80 year old guys in a park in china doing just simple movements and and it's like an internal practice a self a self focused practice um so, you know, I, I am not sure what the future of, you know, Aikido from the, 
the key standpoint, especially, you know, as, as key society is going on where that will end or, you know, uh, but, but I do think that these principles, the four that we covered here, they do have their usefulness. Um, and it's, I wanted to, to have you on because, you know, you've experienced a very similar thing that I have, although I didn't know about it until this last week when we decided to, to have this discussion about how we've advanced, how we teach these principles. And one of the things as being a, a principle-based instructor is the more I see a principle echoed in other arts and other venues, the more universal that principle is. And I love finding principles from pugilism, wrestling, even you know, sports like skiing or you know, any other body discipline art that has principles to it that reflect themselves in, in improving your Aikido or, or anything else, the more I love them. And that's, unfortunately, they're not really codified anywhere. You got to sort of collect them all by hand. Um, but, uh, but I know you wanted to talk also about the, the, the key testing part uh, before we wrap up. <clears throat> uh, and, and this maybe this is a conversation for another day, but I, and we, we touched on it briefly, but um, mm -hmm. we discussed, you know, merits or, you know, pros, cons of doing it. Um, the way we do it at our academy is we do very, very traditional key testing, unbendable arm, unliftable body, all that stuff. The only added layer that we do um, is we add some sort of martial component to it. So for example, if I was going to grab uh, your wrist and try to take you off your, your structure, you know, we do the key test, let you get settled, make sure that becomes difficult to do. And then we go, all right, now your job is to pull this person across that line. Your job is not to get pulled across that line. And can you keep your one point when someone's trying to yank you into a, you know, an alley or something like that, right? And, and, and but it's a layer. We don't start with that. We start with the traditional stuff and then we layer extra things onto it. Well, could you do it if someone was putting a choke on you and pulling you backwards? Would you be able to keep your cohesiveness? You know, and all that is is studying keeping your one point. But if let's say you're not, uh, you hit on something super important. Let's say you aren't interested in the martial aspect of it. Then don't do that. Don't try to choke people that aren't there to, to get choked, right? Just test, test the structure, you know, and call it a day. One of the things, uh, I, I know you've voiced your disappointment about this, but I think you maybe have solved your own mystery. Why did Tohei venture away? Well, it's because the principles can be applied to fishing and golf and Aikido and sumo and baseball. I, I again, I'm not a spokesman for Tohei. I never met the man. I, I don't know. But maybe he just felt his purpose would be better served taking this stuff everywhere, right? If could these things help everybody? Um, I'm, I'm more narrow, you know, I'm more one track mind, you know, I'm narrowly focused. I really like martial arts. Like I just kind of want to do martial arts. I don't, I don't think I could help a golfer probably, you know, I don't think I could help um, a musician. I, I, it's outside my skill set. But we can use these same core things to do what we like, you know, and if as a bonus, we're able to improve someone's confidence or they come, I know you had this, I know for a fact, some student has come and said, this has helped me so much in my other field, whatever that happens to be. That is a wonderful byproduct. Yep. And that is a testament what Tohei's training methods and things like that can do. Sure. Um, that's just outside of my outside of my yeah. scope well and it's understandable that I mean, many people will do something for five years 10 years 15 years and then they don't do it anymore That's like it. They've, done, they've, they've gone into to the distance and I, I, don't, I certainly don't blame Tohei for it um he had such a level of talent I, I I wish he would have stayed in it and kind of you know but that's not my decision that was his decision I did hear fairly recently probably a year or two ago that one of the things that Tohei, one of the experiences he had was he, I guess, was going to speak or do a, a sort of a demonstration of, of Aikido in front of a group. And he included part of doing the, a, a key demonstration like the unbendable arm. And within this group, they were fascinated. They, they were eating it up. 
And the story that I heard was a number of them came to him afterward and said, we, we really like this material, that, that this, this key development stuff that you're doing, but we really don't care about the martial art part. Well, if your customers, you know, want, I don't know, chicken sandwiches and you got a steakhouse and they all want chicken, you're going to start making chicken. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. And you'll start, if the steak ain't selling, you push it off to the side and you get a bunch of people want chicken. You're going to, you're going to satisfy their demand. So like, like you, I don't know what was going on in Tohei's mind or, or what he, maybe it was a natural evolution where, and I've seen many instructors do this. They teach enough people that they just get to the point where they're done. They, mm -hmm. they're, they, they've gone through, they've gone driven over that road time and time again, and it's time for them to move on to something different new maybe they think it's you know they're taking the, the next step in their lives or their advancement or their experience or just moving on to something that's more interesting to them that mm -hmm. that could be too um i don't know if it led to any greater financial success than had he stuck with teaching martial artists um you know we'll, we'll never know Hard to say, right yeah Right, but but it's pretty clear that key society they dress like martial artists. They go through the same, you know, process that martial arts training goes to. I would think if he was focused entirely on just key development for everybody, it would look different than it does. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't. To be honest, I didn't really follow the development of key society from the '70s into the '80s and '90s and and whatnot very closely. I mean, we had a, a key society group in the Twin Cities here, but um, you can't use one group as a litmus for what the whole organization is. But yeah, you know, I've, I've heard of what kind of the groove that they're on generally, and, and, and I get that part, but um, but yeah, I think, I think these principles do are useful. Uh, I think that you just have to be careful using them because they're a little, little bit primitive. I think they could be refined a little better and that's a good thing for us to do. And if, if I had a, a, a breakaway point or a, a takeaway point to convey to anybody listening is don't be afraid to add your own innovations of things that you find work better. Yes, you were provided a great starting point, definitely have the respect for the people that provided you that starting point, but you are, have the duty to take it a little farther. And, you know, we all learn from trial and error not just following the blueprint of what we are given. Um, and so that's kind of where, where I feel with these. And I, I, like I said, I mean, no disrespect to, to Tohei because I have the ultimate respect for him, but I think we could also do a little better. I think that's my, my wrap up point, but is there anything you wanted to add in before we wrap up or did you want to talk uh, key testing? No, no, this is a, this is a great place to call it. I just, if I, if I leave with anything, it's, uh, any model is as helpful is helpful until it's not so just don't get mm -hmm. too married to any one teaching method or training method and if you if you gave these four to a student and it clicked and they like took off right like that's worth it you know yes. and if you go to someone else and I, I think that's maybe one thing that you kind of mentioned is you know we are teaching people like right? these are individuals right and yeah. some things are going to resonate with some and some things are going to resonate with others. And as long as we don't try to um, standardize the process, I think that's where you run into trouble. But as mm -hmm. long as you like are teaching people, then this is a good, this is a, a, a good model to have in your back pocket and then mm -hmm. modify as necessary for your sure. students benefit. And as long as that's the, the, the focus is your students benefit, like you're, it's going to be hard to go wrong. I feel like if you just keep working toward a person's, advancement i think you're going to be all right so absolutely and it's not the only model there i'm sure with every instructor they've all got their own sort of customized uh the things that work for them and they pass them along to their students and you know i'm excited to have this communication via the internet now that we have because we can absolutely. start to learn from one another and find out those principles and methods that seem to work better um you know we've all got stuff to learn so um yeah, this has been a great discussion, Oliver. Thank I was you really so looking much for having me. I'll do, you know, I love doing you this. Bet. I love chatting with you. So it's always great getting us uh, martial art geeks together and just talk talk what we love doing. So absolutely. Um, well, thank you again for coming on the show, and uh, we look forward to the next one. All right, have a good one. 
Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.